Okay. Welcome everybody to this fabulous Working Wednesday webinar. We will be talking about organization and critical thinking today. Um, for those who are attending, we cannot see you, we cannot hear you, but please use the chat function. I will keep my eye on that. If you have any questions that pop up anytime during this webinar, please ask them. Our panelists will be happy to answer your questions. Uh, my name is Hilary Mankowski. I am a project coordinator with Connected Lane County. I will be your host today and let's dive right in. Henry, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Absolutely. Thanks everybody for being here. Uh, my name is Henry Fields. I am a workforce analyst for Lane and Douglas counties with the Oregon Employment Department, which means that I am an economist, but also I help people understand the data that they need. Uh, I have a very fun and interesting job that I'm, I'm excited to share with you all today. Thank you. And Stacy. Hi, I'm Stacy Tours, and I am the CTE teacher on special assignment, a new position for Springfield School District. I just came out of the classroom um, from 23 years of teaching and started the forestry uh, pathway at Thurston. And can you tell us what teacher on special assignment means for those who aren't familiar with that term? That's a good question. <laughs> it's basically a term that they're calling, it's kind of this new thing in education. Um, it's, it's giving an experienced classroom teacher kind of a more leadership role and support role for various needs in the district. Uh, so an example would be like there is a high school math teacher on special assignments. So she helps coordinate some professional development for math, helps coordinate either getting new textbook, coordinating new curriculum, um, those kinds of things, making connections with maybe community, um, things that a classroom teacher who's in the daily grind every day doesn't have the time or can't do. Absolutely, great. All right, so we are gonna start off talking about organization, a very important skill in so many different jobs. Um, how do each of you use organization in your daily job right now? Henry, do you want to go first for this one? Absolutely. Uh, organization is probably the single most important skill that I had to teach myself in a lot of ways in my current role. I'm not a naturally very organized person in my, my personal life, but it's really important for the work that I do. So just as an example, um, Sometimes somebody will ask a question or want to know more about something and the turnaround time they need that is within the day. Somebody will reach out and say, I need some information on this. The sooner you can get it to me, the better. Meanwhile, I'm juggling a lot of things that may not be due or I may not have to think about very much until weeks or even months from now. Um, a presentation that I'm preparing or a long-term research project that I'm, I'm working on. So organization is great because that's what allows me to be able to prioritize those things so that I don't do all one and not the other. Each day has to have a little bit of each of those built in. So um, that's what, what, I'm, what I'm doing when I'm organizing myself is writing reminders, is making sure that I understand how to break up something that is a big project into digestible chunks that I do an hour of work on each day. Or it could be something, for example, if I want to develop a long-term skill, you know, I'm trying to improve my ability to speak Spanish so I can serve uh, customers that have questions about economics in Spanish. And that's not something you learn in a day. It's not something you learn in a month or a year. It's something that you continually improve on over time. And it's only really like organizational skills that help me be able to do that. Do you have any special programs that you like to use? You mentioned like writing down notes, but is there like a program on your computer or do you use like actual sticky notes? Yeah, um, tons of programs. Uh, we have for the email software we use, there's easy ways to make those, but I will make a to-do list basically on whatever surface uh, is facing me most of the day. So a lot of times I'm working on a computer, but I also have things like a whiteboard or a notebook that I keep. And for me, that's really key because if I'm not thinking about those things, or actually probably the single most common thing I'll do is write a note in my phone. And that is something I'll just check, check in on how am I doing on the progress on this. The key is to me having something that you're looking at pretty commonly so that you can see, am I making progress on this? Oh, is there this thing that I've forgotten? So I have a to-do list in my email that I'm checking in on 
that, for example, includes prepare for this webinar that I've had to keep an eye on for the last couple of weeks. Uh, and that's a great example of that's the organizational kind of programs that I use. Great, thank you. How about you, Stacy? It sounds like you're in this brand new role. And so you're probably having to juggle being in the classroom sometimes when, when there's some more teachers being needed and learning a new role and then doing the duties of your new role. So can you talk about how you use organization for all of that? Oh, you're on mute. That's okay. You'd think I'd learn after a year of teaching online, right? Okay. <laughs> um, I tell you what, um, I can give you a little bit of both when I was a teacher, which just recently happened. And now um, it's it, it, a lot of it's similar, but some things are different. Um, electronic organization is key. Um, everything from keeping a calendar online um, to um, keeping your email folders, keeping folders for emails that you need to reference to according to the subject matter so you can find them easier. Um, making to-do lists. I use sticky notes, real sticky notes on my computer um, keyboard, but I also use a sticky note app on the computer to remind me what to do the next day. Um, and then I also use a sticky note app on my phone. However, if I think of something after hours, um, I chunk big projects, uh, just like was said previously, and I'll put things in the calendar to remind myself to go back to it, to make sure I work on it a little bit all the time so that it isn't all, I don't procrastinate. I think procrastination is a human nature thing. We all do it a little bit, um, mm -hmm. but to keep myself from doing it, I make little mini um, deadlines for myself to make it not so overwhelming. Um, Color coding is helpful. Having bookmarks organized on your computer is helpful to, to refer to websites or um, things like that. As a teacher, I kept an electronic lesson plan book so that I could just go to the next year and I could copy and paste it and change dates and then look, look at things that I need to change or adjust. Um, being organized electronically um, in your like Google Drive or on your computer if you have if you have um, PCs with everything labeled correctly so you can find it quickly. Um, yeah, those are a must or it would I, everything would take twice as long. Mm -hmm. That's great. Those are some great tools. Um, Stacy, I'm going to come right back to you with another question. How have you seen students demonstrate organizational skills in school? Um, I will say that uh, the phone is a love-hate relationship in <laughs> school. And one thing that the phone is positive about is the kids will set alarm reminders for themselves for things. That's something I even don't do. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it reminds them that they need to do something or something's coming in five minutes or what have you home to doing homework and everything. Sometimes in class, I will say right now, set a reminder for tonight at eight. You know, not everybody will do it. I'm not requiring it, but, you know, to remind yourself to look to make sure you're done, you know, mm -hmm. or what have you. That is huge um, for them because they don't live without their phone. <laughs> And it definitely is helpful for them, especially in Springfield School District. We are on block schedules. So we have they have class every other day. Okay. So what that means is if you had math class today and you have homework or something, a project you have to work on, but you don't see the teacher again for two days, you need to think ahead. Are you going to do it tonight or are you going to have time tomorrow night? Because no matter what it's due in a couple of days. So it's, it's kind of causing the kids to think ahead a little bit. That's the positive of having that rolling block schedule. Um, they have to pre-plan and think about what, what are they doing tonight and tomorrow and which one's going to be easier to get whatever it is they have to get done. Mm -hmm. That's a major one. And we teach electronic organize. We try to teach electronic organization, uh, for the kids with color coding their drive, making folders, um, those kinds of things. Um, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. However, <laughs> they're in there. Yeah. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> Um, so Henry, from your experience, do you think the examples that Stacy just gave translate to the professional world? We touched on this a little bit, but yeah, without a doubt, I think I think there's some really great examples. The other thing that, that comes to mind that I know I did as a student, and it's probably even more the case now, 
managing a lot, like I was just talking about with my job, if you're in a sport, if you are trying to manage homework, if you are also looking at what classes you're going to have next semester, next term, that sort of multi-level thinking is exactly the type of thing I do all the time. And so students are actually pretty organized or they have to be pretty organized to stay on top of that. And that's one thing that sometimes it, when you start the world of work, you don't necessarily think about those things in the same way, but they really are the same set of skills. So what you do to make sure that you know, you've got uh, sports practice tonight and a game on Friday. How am I going to manage the flow of homework that I know is coming? That is essentially, you know, what I do all day long. So make note, I think it's really important to emphasize too, Stacey brought up a couple different ways that you can approach it, things like color coding. I've talked a lot about time management stuff. The same thing is probably not going to work for everybody. Um, I don't do as much, you know, put things in a certain bin. That's that sort of spatial thing doesn't work as well for me. It's much more, I need constant reminders. Am I, am I checking in on these things, more time management stuff? So there's, there's a huge range of things that you could possibly do. And if something's not working for you, that's okay. Just do, work on a system that does. But how it translates into the professional world, yeah, I think pretty much, you know, one of the most common job skills that businesses are asking for or you're going to use in your working life are, do you know how to manage the tasks that are in front of you? Do you know how to look at something and understand what needs to be done. And everybody has different ways of relating to that, but be thinking about as you're in school, how am I managing these things? What am I falling behind on? And is there a way that I could change how I'm approaching this that might make this better? And if it's working for you, stick to that in your professional life because businesses and employers and your boss and you yourself as a working professional um, are gonna use those things for the rest of your life. It's not just a school thing. So true. I like what, how you brought up sports and projects and things that kids are already doing right now that they're having to think about how they're organizing their time and their day. Um, so, so students are already practicing this. How can students translate that onto a resume or into an interview when if you don't have a lot of experience out in the business world, let's say you're going in for an interview, it's your first one, you haven't had a job before, how can you translate that skill that you're already using in school to an employer? Sure, I'll, I'll, let me take the first swing at that. Um, say if I have some stuff to add on. Uh, I think students way undersell themselves when they come to this. So for example, when you're, in a, when you're crafting a resume or in the middle of an interview, you shouldn't be thinking about yourself as, well, I've never really had work experience in that. More what somebody's asking for is life experience in something. So if I was an interviewer and I'm asking you, uh, give me an example of a time that you stayed organized um, to keep track of, uh, of something that you did at work. What that person is really asking you is something like, show me your methods that you use to keep your brain on track to do the, thing, the work you need to do. And that might be, a perfectly reasonable example of that might be there was this event at my church that I had to plan three weeks ahead. And all of a sudden, you know, play practice was every night because we had something happen, some unforeseen thing happened in my high school career. And here's what I did to solve that. Here's how I organized myself to be able to do that. That's a better show of your organizational skills than, for example, I had this summer job where you know, maybe you didn't have to do that much organizing, but you just showed up and did the stuff. So do not sell yourself short when it comes to that kind of thing. Organizational skills are things that all of us use every day that, that translate into work skills. So I wouldn't, my basic advice would be, don't be shy about including those type of things in your resume and in your interviews. There's definitely a good and professional way to do that through your social activities, through your sports involvement in school, through projects and homework that you work on at school. Um, you know, hopefully your resume is diversified in, in that you've got some of a little bit of everything, but that doesn't mean that your school experiences don't matter for, for these sort of things, just the opposite. That's great, thanks. Stacey, do you have anything to add on to that? Um, I had this very, um, I had this very conversation with my daughter who's a senior just the other day. Um, she does, she's only had one job. Okay. And, and, and it was like, she's, she's a lifeguard part-time, but she's also in the IHS program, which is very demanding, has having to work on her extended essay, which is very demanding, taking her SATs, 
um, applying for college. I mean, she, her life is full. She's in 4-H, um, you know, so just showing an employer how full her life is and how she's met all of her responsibilities for all of those different avenues and how she does it, I think very much translates to, can you do that in the workforce? Do you know what I mean? Because in the, mm -hmm. in the workforce or in your job, you have all those kinds of responsibilities or a lot of different kinds of responsibilities and you got to figure out how to make it all work. And that's exactly what somebody like a senior trying to get a new job or a person who's just getting out of school can say, you know, yeah, I don't have a lot of job experience in your job. However, this is what my life's been like. And I've reached all my goals and completed all my tasks. And this is how I did it. Can I add, that's a very good point, Stacey. I want to underline a little bit of that. Your life experiences and even the difficulties that you faced yeah. actually make a very good case for your organizational skills. So for example, you know, if you have had to deal with issues as a result of poverty or lack of medical care, that takes a lot of organization to think about how am I also going to manage schoolwork with this? And to be able to translate that in an interview is, is hugely impressive. So that's, again, another thing that you might not think of as an asset, but really is. People, are, people understand what that, that means. The, prob the, the problem solving, you know, bringing up maybe not a failure, but a problem and telling them how you solved it or showing them how you solved it, mm -hmm. you know, it's, yeah. it's, yeah. That is great. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out, Henry, that so many different life experiences really help us build these skills that we use in our everyday lives, especially with work. We are going to take a big turn now, and we're going to start talking about critical thinking. Um, so how important is critical thinking in your current role? Either one, Stacey or Henry, jump right in there. Um, let me take a stab at this one first, maybe. Um, so ironically, I was very teaching unstructured, super structured. And this new role I have, it is not that way. And it was really bizarre and it's really strange to change gears. So um, when I need answers to questions, to things in my new role, I have to problem solve to figure out who do I go to to get it or how do I find the, the information out to find the answer to the question. So critical thinking on what's logical, where could I go since I can't get it, you know, like say my um, immediate supervisor. Sorry, technical okay. difficulty. Yeah, um, it's, it's trying to find answers to questions on your own and not always having to rely on somebody else by either doing the research or figuring out an outside entity to answer those questions and not just going, well, I don't know the answer to that. I'm going to give up. You know, you definitely need to poke around and be, um, what do you go, go, go out on a limb and show your weakness and say, Hey, I really need to learn this, or I really need this information. I don't know where to get it. Can you give me some advice on where to turn and not be afraid to just put it out there and ask those questions? Thanks. Henry? Yes. Yeah, so my job is basically what I do all day is critical thinking. So I've, I've put a lot of thought into this, this type of thing. For me, critical thinking means all those things that Stacey was talking about, particularly in, in, in terms of my job, it involves figuring out um, what the actual question is that I'm trying to, to look at and considering, for example, different kinds of evidence to see what the best result would be to answer that question. So there's a lot of different layers to that. But for example, just to talk a little bit more about what I do, I might get a call from a newspaper or a media source saying, we saw that unemployment is this. What does that mean? What, how do we, what we do with this information? I might work in a business saying, I can't find any carpenters. Um, how much should I pay a carpenter to attract the right people? I might talk to somebody at a school that wants to talk about how is the workforce changing? All these things about employment, about wages, about who's working and how much you can earn, how much these jobs are expected to grow. That, those are the types of questions that I answer. And very often it's not a straightforward thing. So for that carpenter example, if somebody's calling me saying I need to hire a carpenter and I tell them $24 an hour. That's not really answering the question. What they want to know is what's competitive, 
what am I, where do I find myself in this whole world? How hard is it to find carpenters? Am I alone here? Is everybody else struggling? There's so many questions within that. So critical thinking is really the process of taking in this information that comes to me, considering everything I know about it, like Stacy was saying, figuring out who knows better than I do about certain aspects of that and bringing it all together in a way that, that makes somebody feel like they understand Oh, they, they know more than they did before they asked me something. So simply to turn around a simple solution as if I can just do some easy math, very rarely is that the case. Critical thinking makes up a ton of, of what I do. And it takes me a long time sometimes to answer a question while I'm figuring out like what's actually being asked, that sort of thing. So yeah, it's very critical to what I do. Um, Stacy, how have you seen students build this skill in the classroom? What kinds of things do they use this for? Oh, okay. Um, for the critical thinking? Yep. Well, I will tell you I'm a science teacher by trade and the new science curriculum has a lot more group work and open-ended inquiry um, kinds of projects where there isn't one necessarily right answer. And so this new curriculum is really trying to embed those soft, I call it soft skills. I don't know. I think that they're called soft skills that the workforce needs, the team, teamwork, the um, accepting all views, the, um, so some curriculums are embedding those soft skills. Also, um, you know, uh, accepting all ideas and views project, oh, project-based learning also is, is big now, instead of just the old typical old school Here's a concept, let's do a worksheet to practice it. It is more project-based where there's a lot more creativity that can be involved, a lot more open-ended ways that, that the project can be accomplished to get the kids to think outside of the box and to work with others. Um, they also incorporate feedback loops, either peer-to-peer, student-to-student, or teacher-to-student. Um, Let's see, also communication skills, working on proper email etiquette, which I'm gonna tell you the kids now are really bad at. Um, proper email etiquette, language, oral, oral speaking, written language to make sure that they, you know, that they're capable of, of, of some coherent written language. Um, there are classes in Springfield for freshmen in high school that teach some of the soft skills too as part of their daily lesson. It's the freshman class, it's called freshman learning team and it's to teach them how to be a student, but it's also job skills and soft skills they teach within that class. And every freshman is required to be in it. They teach note-taking skills, study skills, organization skills, um, teamwork skills, all of those things. And it's embedded into a required class for freshmen. So that's, Great. yeah. And then Henry, thinking about what Stacey was talking about and how that translates into the professional world, especially, I mean, I know communication is sort of wrapped up in both of these skills with uh, organization and critical thinking. I mean, to really think about things critically and then be able to communicate those, that's part of that skill. So um, I think it's really interesting that they're taking those classes but how does, how does all what Stacy talked about kind of translate into the work that you do and the things that you've seen in your professional life? Yeah, absolutely. The, um, the soft skills that, we're, that we just discussed are really important. You know, you can be very good at what the job technically asks you to do. And if you can't communicate that or work with a team or critically think on your own in a situation where you don't have somebody to give you the answer, those things can be kind of meaningless. And any, any job that you observe out in the world is gonna be the case for that. If you go to the doctor and they're a brilliant doctor, but they can't communicate the information they know to you, or they can't see the forest for the trees uh, based on the problem that you are presenting to them as a patient, you can see how that starts to go uh, off, off the track pretty quickly, right? Um, I think the really critical thing for the professional world is exactly what Stacey was talking about when she said that uh, there's not just one answer, right? We get trained in school sometimes to think, even you know, even classes like I, I used the example of math before. Math, in many cases, there's not just one simple answer, but we were raised from a very young age to think, I do the addition and there's one correct answer. If I get it wrong, I get the red pen on my homework. Very, very few things, even in math, work that way. Very few things are just one answer 
or just one way of looking at things. So problem solving and critical thinking is about considering how to weigh each of those things. And that is something that you learn in school. That's something you learn outside of school. And it's a really critical skill set in the professional world, uh, being able to determine not just what the right answer is, but here's important information for this version of the right answer, or here's how I present multiple answers that could be right with the right um, context for what somebody cares about. And that is relevant. It doesn't matter whether you work in medicine, whether you work for the employment department like I do, uh, or you work in a factory where they're making something, but you might need to think about what's going wrong with this process that it, that is creating this result. Or, you know, in the factory setting, for example, maybe you're producing a lot of something, but something in the process is not quite working right. And so you're producing a lot of low quality things. So somebody might say producing a lot of things is all we care about. And somebody else might say producing the highest quality is all we care about. And it's your job to figure out of both of those right answers, how are we gonna figure out what the right the right thing is here? That's something you could do on the job. That's, that's how you would use critical thinking to do that. All right, we just had a question from um, one of our participants. For folks who may struggle more with these skills because of different disabilities or cognitive diagnosis, how can students still navigate the skill building process? Are there tips or tricks? Um, when we teach the organizational skills in the freshman class and in other classes of ours, you know, there's not like, like Henry said earlier, there's not one way to do it. And every, every person, depending on how their brain works, has, has a system that works for them. So the key is finding that system for that child or that student or that adult with the disability and asking what works for them in their life that they've found and then convert it to a skill that they have for a job or what have you. There, and that's the lovely thing. There is not one right answer. It's what's gonna work for them to get the job done. And that's why I brought up color coding earlier because that is big for some students with disabilities, the color coding system. Um, or yeah. You know, you just have to figure out, you have to figure out from each individual, kind of learn about them and find out what's going to work for that person. And sometimes it means, um, like I had one student who did not want to do some things on the computer, so we would print things out, which was fine, you know what I mean, and then mm -hmm. color code it or let them do the project in a different format that works better for them. Um, you just got to be open to receive the information you're asking from them in different ways than what you might think. Mm -hmm. um, as long as you've got the project at hand, like Henry was saying, they can be really great at the skill, but the communication isn't good. Their skill set might be amazing. It's just the way they communicate with you is not necessarily going to be traditional. And you and, and a lot of times you just have to be okay with that and figure out a way around it. Mm -hmm. I like what you're saying about it sounds like trying out different things to see like maybe computer screens don't work for you mm -hmm. but maybe those like actual sticky notes that are super yeah. colorful that really does work for you and you can put them on a mirror or on your yeah. front door I do that a lot I stick a sticky note on my front door because yeah. I'm leaving out my front door so if I need to remember to take something with me I'll see that brightly colored sticky note oh yeah I need to remember to do this thing yeah. That's really great. Henry, did you have anything to add on to that? Yeah, uh, I think it's, uh, again, just to kind of underline this so people that are, that are seeing this and hearing this understand, you know, I said at the beginning, organization doesn't come naturally to me. Um, all of our brains are, I really appreciate this question. This is, this is a fantastic thing to be talking about. Um, it's important to know not only your strengths and weaknesses, but also there's no shame in the way that our brains are built differently. It's okay to take different approaches. And in most instances, it really helps to have a team of people that have different approaches to this. I have people in my organization that are great at putting, um, that are great at uh, putting things together spatially in a way that I am not. Um, so there's always the team approach, but when it comes to tips and tricks for how to build those skills, as has been said, figuring out what works for you is great and don't take any shame in that. Just because you don't do things a certain way 
it's important not to, to internalize that as I'm not good enough. I, I think that's really important. And this is a long time to learn, honestly, in my job. Um, so for, uh, for example, while we're talking, I was taking notes on my other screen so I didn't forget what I had to say. Some people might think that that's you know, unprofessional that I'm looking away instead of listening intently to what's being said on the screen, but it's what I need to do because otherwise I'm gonna forget what I wanna say on this topic. Um, so that's organization. When it comes to problem solving, again, there's different ways of approaching this and there are strengths in, in all of them. So for example, for you to do your critical thinking or your problem solving, you might take more time and focus more on doing that quality job or analyzing it on multiple levels uh, because that's what you need to do. Um, some people are really quick off the draw. You know, they can, they can come up with something to say immediately or they can instantly spot the problems in something. Um, but plenty of people that do a lot of work in critical thinking, their brain doesn't work that way. And again, there's no, no shame in that. The, the important thing to know is that different employers approach that very differently. There are some people out there that you can get a job with that say it's this way or nothing. It's, the, it's my way or the highway. If you can't quickly look at a problem and solve it, then you don't belong on this team. And what I would suggest is if you know that about yourself, that that's not going to work, don't necessarily try to make yourself fit in that environment because that's going to cause a lot of heartache for you that it doesn't need to. Um, I was lucky that I found a team of people that have very different approaches and letting a thousand flowers bloom in that case is really nice. You know, I can do things that certain other people can't and vice versa. So the goal when you're thinking about what job to get should be to how can I help my employer understand what I need and then show them the things that I can do given my skill set. Uh, rather than always trying to meet a standard that, that might not work for you. Great. Thank you both for that. Um, where else? So students can be practicing critical thinking in the classroom. Where else could they be practicing this skill? I think that you can... Uh, I think everybody's interested in, in different things. And I, I think it's fun to practice critical thinking when you're out in the world. If you're interested in plants or animals, thinking about why an animal acts a certain way or something that you observe on the street is a great way to think about, well, what could possibly explain this? Is it this? Probably not. That's, that's an example of the type of critical thinking that I do for my job all the time, considering alternate explanations and things like that. If you're into building things, when you drive around town or when you're going somewhere and you see a building coming up or you see something that doesn't look like it should, it should work that way, trying to think about what's going on there. Who could I ask that might know more about that? Um, basically, I guess what I'm recommending is being a curious person is a great way to practice these skills in the real world. And you can be curious about anything on earth. You know, it, it doesn't, you don't have to be curious about everything. The thing that you care about could be video games. How did this get made this way? I'm playing this game and I'm really enjoying myself. What, what's working here? Or I, I'm, I'm not enjoying myself. What's not working here? That's an example of problem solving and critical thinking that you're doing while you're having a lot of fun. And to be honest, like that's how you're going to find the career that really suits you is the, the things that really draw your attention and you have fun thinking about critically. That's going to be a very fun thing for you to be spending your time doing as a career potentially. I, I think Henry's right. It's in your everyday, in your hobbies, even, you know, I even the other day, I, I enjoy to drive around. I like going places I've never been. There was a traffic jam and I decided to take a different route, figure out a different way to get to where I needed to go and critical think on, well, you know, how am I going to get there and which way, you know, just, just things like that, just hobbies and life skills to try to I don't know, enrich yourself and that helps you, helps you, um, helps expand your brain and your, yeah. So this one feels a little trickier to put on a resume um, because it's not quite as apparent that you are practicing this specific skill. Is, how would you go about doing that if you are applying for a position and let's say you're mostly putting life experience on your resume how could you translate critical thinking onto your resume? I think it's, it can be hard to find the words to put it, but what you're really trying to, if we're talking about a resume, let's, let's start with just a resume. 
it can be hard to find the words that portray this information, but what you're really trying to do is say, I was presented with this information that wasn't clear, that wasn't, it's not exactly obvious what should happen, right? When you go up to a stop sign, you know what you should do in a car. You should stop the car, right? That's a pretty clear signal. What you're trying to do is pick out some examples from your life and think about, I was presented with this information that isn't clear. You know, for example, I, I came up to a stoplight that was out. There was nothing happening. And what did I do with that information? How did I consider what was going on there? So starting with what you're trying to prove, and then you can think about instances in your life that do those things. I was presented with this difficult situation, or I had this thing that I was planning for and life threw me a curveball and here's how I dealt with it. So if we're talking about, you know, uh, maybe a more of a personal example or something like that, um, proving how you uh, move from one thing to another, you know, in 2020, we've all done a lot of things that were very unexpected. Maybe you finished out the 2020 school year in a totally different way than you expected to. And you had a big thing that you were planning for, be it sports, be it um, a school assignment, and thinking about how you took in that information that wasn't clear, what do I do? Everybody is struggling right now. And here's what I did as a result of that. I think that can be a really powerful example of um, how I use critical thinking. And in an interview, you have a lot of, like I was saying with organization, it's really easy to, to come up with um, things that have been difficult to, to solve in your own personal life and talk about why that's meaningful. And that is just as good as uh, work, some work experience that you could have. Mm -hmm. Stacy, did you want to add anything onto that? Um, yeah, it's easier in an interview, definitely, than on a resume. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's finding the words to kind of positively spin things, you know, to show that you've had difficulty in something and you turned around and you created a solution to it. Mm -hmm. That's really hard. <laughs> yeah, it is. But I do think, Henry, what you were talking about with the pandemic, we've all had to do really hard things for quite some time now. So we all have some kind of experience with navigating either successfully or sometimes unsuccessfully. And I think that can also be um, a good example to show employers Yep, went through the pandemic, tried to do online school. It really didn't work for me. But instead of just failing, this is what I did instead. And um, I think that's, that's a great example of of how um, students can kind of show those examples. And maybe it's not best to put on the resume, but maybe that is one that you can cover more in the interview once you have that, that job interview offered. All right, well, I feel like this is a very good stopping point for us. I want to thank both Henry and Stacy for um, spending time with us, thinking about these questions ahead of time and, and really bringing some thoughtful answers to the students who are watching this. Um, and to all the people who are watching this and who will watch this in the future, thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed it. We will be back um, in December with empathy and adaptability. So tune back in on December 8th. Thanks everyone. Thank you all.